So I'm going to start by telling you the stories of a couple of my patients. So I think the value of storytelling in medicine, um, in its contribution to scientific discovery, really can't be sort of overestimated. But much more than that, I want to tell you the stories of these people because the sort of disabilities that they suffer with and the experiences they have in their lives are so strange that it's incredibly difficult for them to continuously continuously try and explain themselves to people. So they and I are really delighted to get an opportunity to be able to share their stories with an audience of this size. So the first person I'm going to tell you about is August. So August is in her 30s now, but when, since she was about 16, she's been having some really strange things happening to her. <laughs> Essentially, two or three times a week, entirely outside of her control, she just bursts into a spontaneous and directionless run. So it could happen at any time and in any place. She has no idea where she's going. She runs until she hits an obstacle. When she hits the obstacle, she changes direction and keeps running. Now, for the vast majority of the time, if you met August, you would not have a clue that there was anything wrong with her. She seems perfectly well. But this sort of 15 minutes of directionless running a week is really wreaking havoc in her life in ways that I will explain in more detail in a little bit later. Now, contrast her with somebody else who has exactly the same diagnosis. This woman's name, um, I'm calling her Maya. Um, her experience is that out of the blue, she gets these sort of uh, sudden irrational feelings of fear. She just suddenly cries out in terror. She then loses awareness of her surroundings. The next thing that happens to her is her right arm starts to stiffen and slowly elevate into the air. That relaxes and she begins to recover awareness, but at that point she finds that she's unable to speak. So she knows exactly what she wants to say, but when she tries to speak, the wrong words come out. Now, both of these people have exactly the same brain disease, and this brain disease I'm talking about tonight because really it's been absolutely pivotal in um, brain exploration. It's told us a great deal more about the brain than a lot of modern technology has to this point in time. Um, but before I get to the how and why of that, you need to understand really is how difficult the brain is to interrogate. So you've got this sort of incredibly mysterious organ which is encased in bone. It's like a hundred billion tightly packed cells. You know, it's essentially a solid object that has absolutely nothing on the surface of it and nothing that will give a clue to how it works. So it essentially doesn't matter if you are solving the theory of relativity or deciding who is your favorite Kardashian, the brain looks exactly the same and you cannot tell how it is, is carrying out those processes. And historically for scientists, in the first instance, the only thing they could do to try and get to the bottom of this was post-mortem. But a post-mortem doesn't do anything but tell you about the structure of a brain. It says nothing about which bit of the brain moves your arm or which bit of the brain you know, allows you to laugh. Um, so essentially, um, that did not move things forward. You know, but even centuries later, when we, or decades later, when we develop scans, once again, here is something that takes still pictures of the brain that looks at internal architecture and structure. But once again, says nothing about function. Doesn't tell you what's the temporal lobe for, what's the occipital lobe for. And that has been always the, the challenge for neuroscientists, is how do you determine those things when scans are essentially photographs? For a long time, scientists realized that there probably was some um, predetermined plan as to how the brain was laid out. And for a very long time, there was only one single way that that could be investigated. And that was by looking at what happened to a person if their brain was injured or diseased. So essentially, science depended entirely on the misfortune of specific individuals who can often be named. So we can look at a particular area of the brain and say, we learned about that area from, of the brain from this person because of this injury. So just to kind of give you an example of that, in 1952, or 1952, 1852 in Paris, a man tried to commit suicide by um, shooting himself in the head. Um, it was not a good day for him. He only succeeded in blowing away the frontal bone of his skull. 
he didn't damage his brain, and he remained, um, a, he remained fully awake. I know this is a very cheery talk, isn't it? But um, I apologize. But basically, um, this man, as if this was not unfortunate enough, his, his misfortune was then multiplied because he fell under the care of a doctor who was interested in this very issue of how is the brain organized, what bit of brain does what. Doctor, seeing this brain exposed, immediately seized this perfect opportunity and began to tap the man's brain with a spatula. He discovered when he tapped the left frontal lobe that the man was unable to speak. So he, he had what we call an expressive dysphasia. He lost the ability to find words. On the other hand, when he tapped the spatula on the right frontal lobe, the man's speech remained intact. And my biggest regret is nobody recorded what the man said at that point, but I'm sure that we can all pretty much imagine. But the point is that this was, this was one of the first pieces of a jigsaw. We suspected that the two sides of the brain were not equal, and we suspected that functions were located in different areas. And through sort of doctors hovering over the sick and dying in this way, we began to put little bits of this brain map together. But you can imagine that any kind of system that relies upon accidents and injuries and so forth is never going to give you a very complete picture. So something much more methodical and systematic was needed in order to move things forward. And that's when I come back to people like Maya and August, because the disease they have turned out to be of fundamental importance to brain science. So both those people suffer with epilepsy. Now, many people will, when they hear the word epilepsy, will consider it synonymous with convulsions, people falling on the ground and shaking, or perhaps daydreaming children in school. And those are indeed common manifestations of epilepsy, but like anything to do with the brain, they are essentially a very small part of a much stranger and bigger picture. So what happens in an epileptic seizure is that you get a burst of autonomous, um, a, a synchronous electrical discharge in the brain that shouldn't be there. So all of our cells are bioelectric, and when we want to, um, when our brain communicates by the spread of electrical discharges, um, but sometimes in people with epilepsy, this becomes autonomous and outside of their control. And if that, I'm hoping if I knock that over, I'll get a bit longer, as I was thinking. Um, and if, but if that electrical discharge involves the whole brain, then you do indeed collapse and have a convulsion. However, it does not have to involve the whole brain. It could involve just a tiny patch of the brain. And which little patch of the brain matters a great deal? So if it happens to be this autonomous electrical discharge in the bit of the brain that moves my toe, perhaps my toe will start t twitching and jerking out of my control but it could involve a part of my brain that has perhaps a more sophisticated function. So for example, the part of my brain that judges the ambient light in the room. What would happen if that was sudden, suddenly kind of electrically hypercharged? Well, what would happen is my brain would be unable to judge the ambient light in the room, and it would start sending a very confusing message to my eyes. And then my pupils, whose job it is to respond to the light in, changes of light in the room, would be confused and not know how to respond. And then what would happen is my pupils would start rhythmically dilating and contracting. So in other words, an epileptic seizure could be a convulsion, it could be a jerking toe, or it could be rhythmically contracting pupils. Because a seizure is essentially just a symptom of a bit of the brain that is diseased. And this is what scientists realized 100 years ago. They realized that if you follow the symptoms of a seizure and you listen to patients describing their seizures, you are quite literally taking an anatomical tour through the brain. And what's more, it can also be used systematically, because you don't have to randomly wait for people to experience seizures. You can also artificially electrically activate the brain. So after the, um, the introduction of anesthetics and antibiotics, what doctors started doing was removing the skulls of awake people. Your brain has no sensations. You can electrically stimulate the surface of the brain without causing any problems and you can reproduce the symptoms of seizures. So if someone does have a jerking toe as a symptom of the seizure, you, you electrically activate lots of areas of the brain until their toe jerks. Now you found two things. You found the area of the brain where the seizures are arising, and you've also found the area of the brain that potentially moves the toe. So you found out two things about the brain. 
you don't have to just look for seizures with these techniques. You can look at all the aspects of the brain for normal activity. So in one of the classical experiments, the doctor who was, who was doing the test electric, uh, electrically um, gave a, a neurostimulation to the brain, and the, the subject of the test or said that he heard an orchestra strike up, and every stimulation produced the same sound, auditory hallucination in the man, which basically probably implies that the doctor was stimulating the part of the brain that's important for the auditory processing of music. And then when he moved to another area and stimulated the brain, the man reported feeling anxious and panicky. So now the area that's important for emotional processing is being stimulated. So it wasn't until very, very recently in the 21st century that we actually got the technology to look at the brain in action. So a huge number of things that we know about the brain is based on these sort of experiments in people with epilepsy and also on the experiences of people with epilepsy and what they describe to us. So what about um, Maya and August in that case? You know, what does their experience tell us and, and what, how will that aid in their treatment? So, in the case of Maya, she was a lady who had had seizures since she was about 16. And I met her first when she was already in her early 50s. So she essentially had an entire adult lifetime of epilepsy. She hadn't had a week without a seizure. Um, her seizures um, provided a huge wealth of clues as to where they may be arising in her brain. So the first thing that happened in Maya's attacks is she felt this feeling of fear. So our temporal lobes run down the side of our heads above our ears, and tucked on the inner surface of those temporal lobes is a, is a small little piece of brain tissue it's shaped like an almond, which is called the amygdala. In the amygdala, that is our early warning system. That's the thing that warns you about danger, and it, it gives you the experience of fear if you detect danger. If you artificially um, neurostimulate the amygdala, it gives you a sensation of fear. So listening to Maya's story, I could immediately say that, okay, it sounds like her seizures begin somewhere in the region of the amygdala. However, there are two of those, so which one is the offending one? So I take, where does the seizure go next and what is the next clue? The next clue is that her arm slowly elevates into the air. That tells me that the motor strip that is responsible for moving her arm must have been electrically activated. The motor strip for this arm is in the opposite hemisphere in the left frontal lobe. So now I've narrowed down my search to the left hemisphere, and if I needed any more evidence to support my theory, then next thing that happened to her is she lost expressive speech. So she lost the self-same area that the 19th century doctor was sort of fiddling with with his tapping spatula. So basically all the evidence suggested she had a problem in the left side of her brain originating in the, the amygdala. We're drawing on the historical patients to help this patient, and how does it help her? Well, it helps her because a surgeon was then able to remove the offending area around the left amygdala, and after 40 years of having seizures every single week, her seizures went away completely. She was absolutely cured, and she's never had another seizure since. Now, August's story does not end quite so well, although it certainly for me, has very many life-affirming features through, no, through personally knowing August. Um, so August seizures, um, they are every bit as bad as the day I first met her. So I've been looking after her, I would say, for about 10 years, and she has a cluster of these seizures, of running seizures every week, and nothing I've done has really made them better. These seizures are what we call hyperkinetic seizures. So these are motor seizures. They involve lots of movement. All of the movement areas, and most of the movement areas, exist within the frontal lobes. And there's lots of different areas. So some of them produce simple movement, like an arm stiffening or rising in the air. And they're, they're, um, that's the primary motor cortex. But some of the other motor areas are very important for coordinating movement, for planning movement. So when you run, you know, you have to plan... Um, know where your limbs are in space. You have to control your posture. You have to coordinate one side with the other side. So there's a lot of various movement areas in the frontal lobes will, that will do this for you. But unfortunately, because those areas are what we 
in neurolo neurologists called eloquent cortex, not something you want to lose in other, case, in other words. It isn't possible for somebody like um, August to have an operation as Maya did to cure her epilepsy and drugs haven't worked. So she is more or less, unfortunately, probably gonna have lifelong seizures. And it has, it has really blighted her life and made it incredibly difficult. She has had experiences where she has run off a bus, left her bag, her wallet, everything behind, run in the door of a stranger's house and just woken up sitting on a stranger's sofa surrounded by a large sort of multi-generational family who I should add were very nice to her. Um, she's run out in front of traffic, she has fallen downstairs and now she stays at home as much as she can. She very rarely goes out. Unfortunately, her home is not a safe place either. She usually keeps her front door firmly locked. Her mother came and visited once and left the door open, front door open while she went to leave the bins out. And essentially, um, unfortunately, um, August, sorry, when you make up names for patients, the real names keep coming into your head and you're gonna, August basically ran out the front door and she woke up standing in the middle of the street with her next door neighbor standing this close to her and he was shouting at her and I always remember her telling me that she could feel the spit landing on her face, he was so angry. And apparently she had dragged his baby buggy several feet and he had been convinced that she was trying to take the child and she was arrested and it took several months for us to undo this. So her life has been unbelievably hard and I would very much say that I have utterly failed to help her. Oh, God, I shook it and the last few grains went through. I won't do that next time. Um, so basically, the um, her life has been unbelievably difficult and I, you know, I come from a sort of, I'm sort of a practical person and I have always had difficulty accepting my value as a doctor if I can't actually cure somebody or alleviate their symptoms. So I would always say that I've never helped August at all, although I know that that's not her view of it. And I think, you know, that's where the sort of, you know, listening to people's stories and storytelling in medicine takes on a sort of new level of importance because she feels that her story is being heard and she feels that she's being believed. And in that, that in itself, without curing her, has given, given her some peace of mind. And I should add that I have to, I learn a great deal from August because I've never met anyone else with a disability like hers. You've got to realize that when the brain is diseased, the breadth of symptoms that it can produce are just as broad as the breadth of what the brain does when it's healthy. So in other words, the, the possibilities seem almost endless, so it's inevitable that I will be constantly coming up against things that are outside the realms of my experience, and that is the case for August. And of course, she's never met anyone with her disability, so neither of us have anyone to refer to. And we kind of learn together. And I find watching her extremely life-affirming. I mean, she's built a world inside her house where she's setting up a bakery business, where she paints, where she's interested in music. So she's kind of learned to live within the limits, to live a very full life within the limits of her disability. So I feel really that from my personal journey has been, you know, that in medical school I learned about science and I learned about the importance of storytelling to take me into my patient's organs to understand a diagnosis. But as a consultant, I've sort of learned more about the importance of storytelling to kind of teach me about humanity. And I find that, you know, my patient stories tell me about their brains first, but more importantly, they tell me about like resilience and how to survive hardship. I find the stories very valuable and I appreciate your listening to them and I hope you find them valuable too. Thank you. Thank you.